God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with her surging. If you were here a few weeks ago, I introduced that passage from Psalm 46 to you. And we talked about refuge. And we talked about that idea of being in that place, that kairos place. Not that place where we measure time or minutes, but that situation where we are captured by our Creator, where we experience something mysterious, something overwhelming, something powerful, and we just rest in that. And I want to take you to the next passage in Psalm 46, uh, verses 4 to 7. And uh, I have been, for the last month, not doing a whole lot of teaching. I've been sailing. I've been shooting bottle rockets with my grade 8 class. I was backpacking last week. And so I've been out of the classroom, and I haven't really taught a lot. And so today I'm going to pull you into my classroom probably like I never have before. And uh, you are going to feel like you're back in school. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be firing questions at you, and you're going to be helping me out. We're going to work through this together, and it's going to be really interactive. So if, if you feel like you're in a classroom, you are. Um, that's just the way it's going to be today. And uh, I want to take you to the next section in Psalm 46. And it's, it's verses 4 to 7, and it's about this idea of a river. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will be with her at break of day. Kingdoms are an uproar, nations fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. I want to talk about this idea of a river. And... We know a lot about rivers where we live. Of part of Langley and the Fraser River. And um, you can see the farmland of uh, northern Langley there on that bend. And we all live close enough to the Fraser River. We cross it, we pay those rotten bridge tolls. We know about the river. And this whole community that we're a part of, whether it's Langley or Abbotsford or Surrey or Burnaby, is all built on the river. And how many of you have been to Fort Langley? Okay, yeah, most of us. And uh, one of the earliest settlements on the Fraser River uh, was the fort and all that goes with that. And we see remnants of that as we go and visit the fort for special events or we actually tour the fort itself. And... Uh, we're probably familiar with, with some of the uh, First Nations uh, land um, that we use, that we borrow, that we share. What is it about the Fraser River that has allowed us to become a settlement, a civilization, a city that's allowed us to flourish? What does the Fraser River give to us even today? Here we go. Hands up. Good. Good. Seaport? Good. What else? What does the Fraser River give us? Why are we here? Why is it getting so big and populated? Four? Good. Good. Yes, from time to time. Food, fish. Sure, industry. If you uh, go down to the Knight Street Bridge or the Oak Street Bridge and look up the Fraser River, all you see is factories and industry that use that water to cool machinery or to move things in or out by barge. Um, Sure. The Fraser River is the only reason why you and I live here. No fresh water, no river what we know as this lower mainland community would not exist. The second picture 
is Jerusalem. What's missing? The river. The people of Israel, David, when he wrote this psalm, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. It's an interesting idea that he would mention river because the inhabitants of Jerusalem then and even today have no understanding like we do of a great river that gives us all the things that you just mentioned. Their water is coming from underground springs, small streams, but the idea of a mighty river was very, very foreign to the people who lived there. And I want to talk about why for a minute. And this next image gives us a couple of uh, 3D terrain maps. And the one in the top left shows the country of Israel. Do I have a laser on here? You can see in the north the Sea of Galilee, that little blue lake. And then you can see further to the south the Dead Sea. What you can't see so clearly is in between those two small bodies of water and the Mediterranean Sea on the left are the Judean mountains that run parallel down the middle. And if you live to the west or to the left of those Judean mountains, closer to the Mediterranean Sea, you live on nice, flat farmland, lots of water, you can grow food, you can grow crops, you're near the ocean, you have access to transportation. But if you live in the mountains between the Mediterranean Sea and between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, you're up in the hills. In fact, as you move east towards the Dead Sea, you enter a desert or a rain shadow, kind of like going to a Soyuz. You cross those mountains into Penticton, a Soyuz, and it gets dry, it gets hot in the summer, and there's not a whole lot of rain. And Jerusalem is kind of right on that transition up in the mountains where if they go to the west a little bit, they get down into the rain and the farmland, the olives, the figs, the grapes. But if they go to the east, they get to the sheep country where it's dry and the farmers go out with their sheep and they eat anything that they can find. And so Jerusalem, geographically, is in a really strange place. Uh, You go a few miles one way, and you're in lush farmer's fields. You go a few miles the other way, and it feels like you're walking out into a desert. And so geographically, it makes perfect sense why there's no big rivers there. This second map shows the Strait of Georgia. The bottom of that circle, bottom left over here, is uh, the southern tip of Vancouver Island. And then you can see on this side the floodplain of the Fraser River, that lighter green color. Vancouver, Burnaby, Richmond, Delta, Surrey. All those cities that we know and talk about are in that area. And you can see the inlets carved by ice You can see the mountains capped with snow, whistlers in there somewhere. And we are fed by glacial water. We're fed by um, a great climate that brings rain as um, air comes off of the Pacific Ocean and hits those mountains and rises and rains on us. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to North Vancouver in the winter. You think it rains a lot in Langley? North Vancouver, up by Cypress and Grouse, they get almost twice as much rain as us. And all that rain falling on those northern mountains pours down into the Fraser River, and we experience the benefits of that climate and that geography in the lower Fraser Valley. So we've got two very different locations, one that is inundated, drenched in rain and water, and feeds these great rivers and lakes that we know on the west coast. And then you've got Jerusalem, that for the most part, climate's a little bit warmer, not a whole lot different than Vancouver and Langley, but the amount of water that they experience is completely different. So then why does David, in this psalm, talk about a river? 
Why does he talk about a river? Any ideas? Why would he start that second section of this psalm, this psalm of celebration, talking about a river that makes glad the city of God? It's a metaphor? You're right. Any ideas what it's a metaphor talking about? Okay, God's love. Any other ideas? I heard someone over here. Say that again. Spirit of God. Any other ideas? Why river? What's so significant about water and rivers in Scripture? Okay, just a sec. I need one at a time here. I, I heard a whole bunch of great things. Someone over here? Life. Yes, Rose at the back. River of Life. There's her, her new painting she just finished. She was showing it to me. It's beautiful. If you haven't seen it, have a look at it later. R- rivers flow? Okay. Okay. Say that again. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Genesis chapter 3 talks about four rivers in the garden. Let me read it to you. The beginning of our scripture, very, very early on in the story of creation. Sorry, Genesis 2. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds to the entire land. The second name is Gihon. It winds to the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. The fourth, Euphrates. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil, and when you eat of it, you will surely die. The book of Genesis is, uh, we give credit to Moses for writing the book of Genesis, and uh, Moses did not write in a cave all by himself. He wrote in the context of the culture around him, and the dominant culture of that period of time was the Babylonian culture, and the Babylonians are known even to this day There's a few remnants in the country of Iraq of that culture of building these massive temples that we call ziggurats. Um, And they would reach up into the heavens and they would have priests who would go up to the top and they would offer sacrifices to the Babylonian gods, in particular the greatest Babylonian god, Marduk. And it it was a transaction, an exchange. We'll give you something, you give us something in return. We'll offer you crops, food, you bless us for the following year. So it was, it was this very dry, very impersonal exchange. And that was the idea behind the Babylonian culture. What this um, archaeological site doesn't show is what they would have around these great temples. And this artist drawing gives you a better idea A Babylonian temple would be built by a river, by a stream. And it would be filled and covered with plants and gardens, and streams would flow right nearby, and they would draw water to irrigate and to plant and to nurture the natural vegetation and anything else they planted. And so water was extremely important. Moses understood this idea in the culture around him. And to give you an example, think of yourself in American culture. Someone tell me, what is an example of an American influence that is so deeply a part of Canada, sometimes we don't even realize it's not Canadian? Who can think of an example? Sure. Absolutely. Greed? Uh, I think we're all greedy, but yeah, sure. Yes, most of our television 
is not Canadian made. We've got a few channels, a few series, but most of it comes straight from the United States. And we often forget that. We have our favorite show, and it's very much an American idea that's in our culture. Yes. What else is part of Canada, and it's so deeply ingrained in our culture, but really we have imported it straight from the United States? Hockey, yeah, used to be a Canadian sport, but not so much anymore. Basketball, yeah, okay, a lot of sports, football, uh, basketball, a lot of sports that we play in Canada originated at least at the professional level um, as as part of a, a huge thing in our culture from the United States. So we understand influences and how other cultures that are really bigger or more powerful or older or long-lasting just kind of saturate you and you begin to think of the world in terms of that larger cultural idea and not so much what it means to be just a Canadian. What would be purely, without a doubt, Canadian to the core? Good? Okay. Good? Tim Hortons, thank you. We do have some things, but they're probably, if we're honest, not nearly as significant, long-lasting, or influential, at least yet, as the things that we have absorbed from our American neighbors. So if you think of it that way, when Moses writes Genesis, he would have been influenced by images, ideas, in the bigger culture around him. And when he writes about a garden, I'm pretty certain he would have thought of those types of gardens from these giant Babylonian temples. And that would have allowed his readers to to begin to imagine from things they'd actually seen what creation may have looked like at its beginning. Water giving life, lush vegetation, growth, um, beauty, those Babylonian temples would have shown that and represented that. Then we go to the end of Scripture, and we hear about another river in Revelation 21. So Scripture begins with this idea of a river and four streams, And then if we go to, sorry, Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations." Once again, we see the significance of water, of the river. So Genesis begins with the river, the tree of life. Have you ever thought about the tree of life? The tree of life gets ripped off when we talk about the creation story. All we talk about is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we know that's the one that brought sin into the world through disobedience because the command simply was, don't eat from this tree. But there were two trees. And the tree of life that we hear about in Genesis 2 comes back in Revelation 22. And it says there's one on each side of the river. What do you think the tree of life represents in the biblical story? Eternal life? Okay, goodness. Any ideas? Because we often forget about it. We just think of the tree that started all the problems. Okay? Okay, being grafted, I like that. Okay? Let me suggest that the tree of life represents everything as it should be, as God intended His creation goodness, wholeness, um, love. The tree of life represented that perfect creation. And we hear about it at the beginning 
we hear about it at the end. And in Revelation, the purpose of the tree of life is to offer food and sustenance, but to bring healing. But it's sitting beside the river. So all through the Bible, whether it's Genesis, the Psalms, Revelation, we get this powerful imagery of the river giving life, giving growth, um, bringing us on a journey. And so David, when he writes this psalm, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy place where the Most High dwells. We get this picture of life, of refuge, of things being the way they should be, the way they were meant to be. But what happens at the end of this phrase, this second section from 4 to 7, um, it goes on to say, he lifts his voice, the earth melts, and then verse 7 stands alone. And I'm going to come back to this again in July where we hear it repeated again. It's a refrain, a chorus. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The best translation is not the word fortress. Um, if we go to the Amplified Bible or the New American Standard Bible, it has a better word and it, and it talks about a high place, a stronghold. Again, this idea of refuge. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So here's, here's my last question for you this morning. Why the word or the name Jacob? Why does David, when he writes this psalm, talking about this idea of refuge, protection, this river of life, why does he mention Jacob? Why not Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Adam? Any ideas? What's the big deal about Jacob? I'm going to test your biblical wisdom here. Say that again? Are you thinking of Isaac? What do you mean by sacrifice then for Jacob? He was put into Egypt to save his people. Joseph, sorry. You're on the right track though, because you've mentioned, you've mentioned a father and a son. So we're, we're, we're in the right direction here. Okay, so Jacob was obedient. You're thinking of Abraham. Abraham sacrificing Isaac? We're, we're in the, we're, this is all good. We need all this. What is it about Jacob in this story of Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, the 12 sons? Okay. They're all connected, descendants. Yeah. Okay. What's the story that happens with these patriarchs going from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, then to his 12 sons going to Egypt, Joseph becoming a great leader working beside Pharaoh? Any ideas? I'll give you a one word clue. Covenant. Covenant. Anybody? What, what covenant is happening with these men? Do you remember the blood covenant between God and Abraham? I, I, I think I talked about this maybe a year and a half ago. I know it's a long time ago. The blood covenant. Abraham... Genesis 15, Abraham and Elohim come together and they make a covenant together and um, the promise in that covenant is that Abraham's descendants will become a great nation. Isaac, he's asked to exchange, to give up his son and part of that Middle Eastern covenant was to exchange coats 
and weapons and food and to share a meal and exchange names and exchange sons. And there was all these different parts in that blood covenant, and one of them was to exchange sons. And Abraham is asked to give up his son Isaac. And he almost, he goes through it, but God stops him and says, no, I understand that you're willing to do this. But it is one man who actually shows that that covenant becomes the real deal. Jacob has 12 children who become the fathers of 12 tribes who, when they come out of Egypt, become the nation of Israel. It is Jacob that becomes the evidence of that promise of that covenant. And so David brings back his name. Not only to remind people of God's protection and his refuge and his promises, but here is the evidence. Jacob, the forefather, the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, who experienced this covenant, he is the one that that shows us that this is actually happening. Fortress in the mountains, a stronghold. This entire psalm is about refuge and life and protection. And I've never been here. It's somewhere in Eastern Europe. But when I found this picture, it was such a perfect example of there's no way that you can be attacked. There's no way that people can get in. This idea of being held safe, strong, in a high place, a place of refuge. And as I ended last time, there is a Hebrew word that is used in this psalm three times. Selah. It's a musical term that means pause or break or reflection. And if you remember from June, I I played a song from a Christian group from South Africa that took that same name, Selah. And I want to play a, a second song for you that they have written Um, that's called You Are My Hiding Place.
So Psalm 46, God is our refuge, that shelter, that stronghold. But not only are we given rest and protection, but we are given life. And we have that image of the river. And when I come back in July, we're going to finish off this psalm. And we're going to talk about the beauty of God's voice. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Scripture that promises us hope in what you planned, hope in creation as it should be. We get a glimpse, just a glimpse of what you intended. But more importantly, we get even a greater glimpse of what is yet to come when you will heal the nations. Thank you for the promises of Scripture. Thank you for the words that encourage us. Thank you for the way that we are taught and reminded each time we look again. In your name we pray, amen.